welcome to the University of Coruscant. As part of your enrollment here, you have access to the attached Holonet recording. You've selected a lecture by Dr. Sonny Ravencourt on Bounty Hunters. You've selected a lecture by Dr. Sonny Ravencourt on Boba Fett. If you have any questions about this lecture or wish to contact us, please visit universityofcoruscant.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot tell you how thankful I am to be back in the grand lecture hall at the University of Coruscant. In Coruscant, and not in a cave, or in a cantina, or in a casino hiding out, I much prefer my office with the steam tub to a frozen wampa layer. And can we take a moment to appreciate this lecture hall? I mean, wow. Dean Forgana really outdid herself with this remodel. I think it brings out my eyes and just a touch of auburn in my hair. I'm sure that was her intention. Also, before I go any further, I'd like to have you all give a big round of applause for my TA, Todd, Todd, definitely Todd. Todd spent the semester living life out in the galaxy, and I like to think that I taught him some valuable lessons of survival along the way. Todd, what do you have to say about what you've learned traveling with a famous holodrama star for a semester? Well, sir, Fabulous. I... Thanks, Todd. I really mean it. Now, I'm sure that all of you have been keeping up with the lectures over the holonet. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to be here personally for you, but the lecture material was no lower quality. We've talked an awful lot about bounty hunters this semester, but if you remember last semester's lectures on weaponry, I think it wasn't hard to read between the lines that I have some favorites. When you combine last semester's lectures on weaponry and this semester's lectures on bounty hunters, then there's only one logical bounty hunter that we can finish with. And that bounty hunter is none other than Boba Fett. <laughs> Boba Fett. I feel like we've been dancing around a lecture on him for a long time. Last semester, we had an entire class on his iconic weaponry. A couple weeks ago, we talked about his father. Well, father isn't quite right, is it? His clone daddy? Uh, I don't know. That's much weirder. I don't, I don't like that at all. We're going to go with father. You know, I could just gush about this guy all day long, so we better just start or we're never going to get out of here. If you haven't heard my lecture on Django Fett from a few weeks ago, then you're missing out on the origin story of whom I consider to be the greatest bounty hunter of all time. You see, part of Django Fett's agreement with the Kaminoan... Kaminoan? Can't, somebody's gonna send me hollow mail on that one. With the cloners was that, as a part of his compensation, he would get an unmodified clone of himself to raise as a son. Unmodified. That means no growth acceleration. If you want a clone army, you don't want to have to wait 18 years to get them up to fighting age, so you speed up the process. The clone that Django wanted was a pure replica of himself. He named him Boba Fett. If you're Django Fett and you have a son and nobody else, then it's not a big stretch to imagine that Django taught Boba basically everything he knew. And you don't have to look any further than Boba's gear. It's basically Django's loadout with the exception of the pistols. Django was a real gunslinger who liked a matching pair of Westar 34s with hollowed out grips. If Django used a scalpel, well, Boba's choice of weapon was more like a hammer. The 10 loss DXR6 disruptor rifle. As I've previously stated, a disruptor rifle is a no muss, no fuss situation. Well, maybe a little bit of muss if you wing somebody, but if you hit him straight on, definitely no muss, no muss at all. Just a pile of ash. That'll quiet a room awfully fast. But other than that, it's all pretty much Django. The wrist gauntlet toolbox with the smart rope, flamethrower, all Django. Jetpack, just like Dad. Boba did decide to go a little bit lighter on the armor, though, and doesn't have the thigh or shin armor that Django did. There's another thing that I take umbrage with a lot of other historians about. They say, oh, Boba carried this and Django carried that. 
I mean, I guess kind of like I just did. But I'm going to put a big caveat on it. Boba Fett was famous for not wanting to be boxed in. He adapted. He changed his tactics, and sometimes that meant having a different loadout. Did he carry a dart launcher like Django? Well, if he needed it. And that answer works pretty much across the board. Did he need it? Well, then he carried it. And this is how you become the best. You don't make yourself inflexible. You fill the needs to the job. Be like water. I don't really know what that means. I saw it on a holodrama late at night, and the dude seemed to know what he was talking about. And, well, it kind of works right here. So Boba Fett was like water. He would always fit the space that he had to occupy. Oh, maybe that's what that means. <laughs> when Jango Fett died, Boba was still young. Sources differ, but it probably puts him in the 9 to 10-year-old range. Old enough to have a good understanding of what was happening, but too young to really have the strength to get revenge. You can be clever, but eventually somebody's going to call your bluff and you have to back it up. So, if you're really clever, you start to build yourself a crew until you can go solo. The first in Boba Fett's crew was the already famous Aura Singh. Singh had a bit of a thing for Jango Fett, most people think. She ends up being an early mentor to young Boba, but with Aura Singh, it's hard to really tell what she was thinking at all. I can guarantee you one thing, and that is when push comes to shove, she's going to look out for Aura Singh. She is a survivor. But in the meantime, it's undeniable that she wanted to help Boba learn some tricks of the trade. It didn't hurt that he was hunting Jedi, something that Aura Singh was particularly fond of. The Jedi in question was, of course, Mace Windu. He killed Boba's father. Boba wanted revenge. Still, I mean, you gotta admire the kyber crystals on this kid. He decides that his first venture out's gonna be hunting a Jedi Council Master. That's like learning to throw your first spear and then deciding you're gonna toss it at a mudhorn. Good luck, kid. So, it doesn't work, of course. Although Boba showed arguably what might have been his most stylish action. Boba Fett was kind of an all-business sort of bounty hunter, but he made an exception with Mace Windu and put explosives in his father's helmet. The helmet was rigged to explode when Windu came across it, and he came really close, but killing a Jedi is really hard. Killing a Jedi Master is really, really hard, and the only guy to do in Mace Windu would be Darth Sidious himself, and he had help, and some luck, and, and that comes much, much later. Boba Fett grows up a little more and starts a crime syndicate called Crate's Claw. It's got some pretty big hitters in it, too. Dengar, Bosk, Aura Singh, Embo. I haven't really talked about Embo, but he could have easily been in this semester's list of legendary bounty hunters. So this crew is not too shabby, particularly for a teenager to be assembling. During this time, Cad Bane is pretty clearly the top dog in the galaxy, but it's not hard to see who might be the heir apparent. If a teenager can herd these animals and point them in a unified direction, <laughs> Well, that's promising. After the crate's claw years, Boba is now old enough and strong enough to really do it his way. And he kind of goes off the radar for a bit. He adopts the Mandalorian look of his father, he manages to get Slave One, his dad's old ship back, and then he goes to work. He already had a pretty solid reputation with all of his adolescent efforts, but now he's really coming into his own, and he's fanatical about the jobs that he's doing. His reputation becomes deadly, and he is not to be messed with. This is no longer little Boba playing crime boss. This is now Boba Fett? Boba Fett, where? And just like that, he's the top bounty hunter in the galaxy. When you're the top dog, the big clients find you. And big clients are people like Darth Vader. Vader came to Fett a little bit peeved that some no-name kid blew up his Death Star. Vader wanted that kid pretty bad and paid Fett to bring him in. Well, Fett found that kid, Luke Skywalker, on Tatooine and roughed him up pretty bad. Skywalker, by what I can only call the will of the Force, managed to escape with his life and whatever blood he had left in him. Seriously, if Vader hadn't been very specific about Skywalker being alive, well, I'm sure Fett would have left him a smoking hole in the desert. But somehow, Luke got away. Fett had to go back to Vader and tell him the news. 
Well, the Sith Lord asked if Fett got anything, and Fett told Vader the name of the boy was Skywalker. Darth Vader, formerly Anakin Skywalker, didn't say anything. But I think you can all appreciate the ramifications of him learning that name. Vader hires Boba Fett a second time in our now famous lineup of bounty hunters on the Executor. The Notorious Six. <laughs> I'm sorry. I still can't come up with a better name for them. The Half Dozen Hunters? <sighs> That is much worse. Whatever. Anyway, this is the famous Millennium Falcon contract. I'll save you the suspense. Boba Fett is the one who cashes in. He actually cashes in double. Fett tracks the Falcon heading to Cloud City on Bespin and informs Vader, who then beats the Falcon there and coerces the administrator Lando Calrissian to trap Solo, which he does. Side note, during his stay on Bespin, Fett has a dust-up with one of the IG-88s who barely makes it out of there in one piece. Just a fun fact that Fett had time on the side to scrap a droid, all while collecting from Darth Vader. Fett then takes Solo to collect a second time when he turns Solo into Jabba the Hutt back on Tatooine. Not bad work getting paid twice for one bounty. That's why he was the best. Unfortunately, while on Tatooine, Fett has a bit of an accident. Solo gets out of Carbonite and he and Luke Skywalker somehow, and I do repeat somehow, send Boba Fett into the gaping mouth of the Sarlacc. Now, I'm telling you this not as your professor, but as a fan of history. One, there is no good explanation as to how those two managed to defeat Fett. Luke Skywalker wasn't even close to the power that he would have later in life. And Solo was just out of carbonite, which is designed for meat packing and not for people. He could not have been in good condition. People are fighting about this on the holonet to this day. Number two, the other thing they're fighting about is whether or not this was indeed the end of Fett. People claim to have spotted him all over the galaxy afterwards. To me, I think he made it out. I think that he used being dead to his advantage, too. It's a very fat thing to do. Operate in the shadows. Control your own fate. Build fear right into your name. That's extremely Boba Fett. But we may never know. What we do know is that the son of Jango Fett, who was the best bounty hunter in his day, was absolutely no disappointment and rose to even greater heights. A clone by birth, a crime lord in his teens, and the greatest bounty hunter to ever live in his prime. The galaxy will never forget the name Boba Fett. Well, that's the end of the lecture, but we haven't done one thing in a very long time, and that's ask students for a question. So, who's it gonna be? Welcome back, Professor. Ah, oh, it's my favorite Padawan, Blur Lightfire. I've really missed you. How did you get along while I was gone? Well, we spent a lot of time planning a candlelight vigil for you, but it turns out you didn't die. Well, that's distressing. Did I miss anything else? Um, they put that statue of you in Bomb Shelter K, but we moved it to the staff lounge and some engineering students durasteeled it to the floor. Oh, that may be the greatest thing anyone has ever done for me. What's your question, Blur? Why did so many people think Boba Fett was a Mandalorian? Was it just his armor? Great question. And the answer is yes, but it takes a little bit more explanation. You see, a Mandalorian's armor is not just about the look, but also about the material. Mandalorians were regarded as some of the galaxy's greatest warriors and could take on Jedi, but they didn't have any force powers. Well, one did, but that's a very long story, and then we'd have to get into the Darksaber. The point is that you have to ask how on earth they could have become so fierce. Well, one of their secret weapons was a metal alloy called Beskar. Beskar was mined on the planet Mandalore and was used in Mandalorian armor, and it was so strong it could withstand direct blaster fire and even lightsaber strikes. Hence, their ability to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Jedi. It was rarely sold because it was almost religious to the Mandalorians. So, with Fett, 
We know he's not really a Mandalorian. He's a clone of his father. But he does what his father does because that's the only life he ever knew. He acts like a Mandalorian, he looks like a Mandalorian, and he's wearing Beskar. So if you're an average alien and this guy walks in, he is a Mandalorian to you. If you see him in action and he takes a blaster bolt off the armor and you realize that it's Beskar, then there is nobody in the galaxy that is going to convince you that this guy is not a Mandalorian. And so that's how reputations like this are built. It doesn't matter what the truth is. The only people wearing Beskar are Mandalorians, and that's exactly how Fett rolled. You be the one to tell him that he's not a real Mandalorian. <laughs> and again, my students, we have reached the end of our journey. One more semester in the books, and I hope you've enjoyed listening to my lectures as much as I have enjoyed recording them. One thing I did learn is that repairing the Grand Lecture Hall is extremely expensive, so I'm not going to be giving away any more probe droids. That, that did not go over well. But it looks like things are finally turning up Ravencourt. So have a great break and I'll... Oh, oh, hang on. Oh, this can't be real. This number is my agent. I thought he was dead. This is Sonny. I'm fine. How are you? I mean, it's been a while. I thought you died. Oh, nothing for that long? Ugh. Well, I guess I'd rather believe you were dead. What? A full length holodrama starring me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, goodbye. I'm back, baby. This concludes your selected lecture from the University of Coruscant. For all questions or to contact us, please visit universityofcoruscant.com. This podcast is part of the Red 5 Network. For more Red 5 Network podcasts, visit red5network.com. Hi, this is Dr. Sonny Ravencourt, and the legal droids behind me... No, I'm not going to say your names... They want me to remind you that if you've enjoyed this show, please subscribe on iTunes and YouTube and leave a review or a comment. It helps us out tremendously, and it allows the university to continue to provide you the best in Star Wars history. Are you going to pay me for another take? Well, then I'm not going to do one.